All the things are hooked up. I got the level. Yes, Gene Shepard, I've got my levels. I've got my mic cranked up. I got my guest on hold. He's been <laughs> patiently waiting. He, of course, is Radio Hope Mike Myers, starting like a minute early today, by the way. Hey, this is cool. I'm good Hi. with it. I'm not even upset that we're starting early. How are you doing? How are you feeling this morning? You know, speaking of uh, starting early, my wife chastised me because of how nitpicky I've been about our starting times. Really? Tell me more about that. No. <laughs> I don't want to tell you anymore. She just, it's its back to, I project my sins. I've added some new notes. I could see that. These are note cards. And so I'm, a, I'm, I'm hypocritical. I'm a, I'm, I'm, well, you're just human. I'm like Ed Delgado. I'm my own hero. What the f- heck? <laughs> you could say it. There's no censorship here. Um, no, no, I get it. There needs I, to be I, some self censorship. I don't mind the 8 a.m. start time like Eastern because I need this. So I just try and stick to it as much as I can. Believe it or not, this morning I almost didn't even want to get up to do it because I was a little tired. But I'm like, well, it's a commitment I made to Michael, so I'm doing it. <laughs> And you know that, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to just try to be quiet and re- respond to your questions and be uh, laser fo- focused. <laughs> no, what, what, what? I'm you focusing. Were go- you were going on a path there and then you diverted from the path you were going on when responding to that. And then I, did, didn't I come back? A little bit. But no, I'm am I serious. looking at? Am I looking at you? Yes, you're looking right at me, actually. So I'm just making sure I got the camera thing. So when you see okay. into my eyes, do you see tiredness or do you see someone who's awake? When I look into your eyes, I see a young man with hair. Yeah, it's grown back. And a good-looking young man. Uh, thank you, Michael. And thank a young you. man with his whole future ahead of him in broadcasting excellence wait a minute no he, he doesn't have a corner on broadcasting excellence uh anyway okay? no i just uh of course i want to get to that point but the podcasting thing is a good start to get onto radio eventually i think Yes, and actually, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I'm waiting for an email back from Spreaker. Oh, what email is that now? Well, I go through this every year and, you know, living on, we don't have a whole lot of bucks. And they usually work with me on the on the rate. So you pay. See, I have... Which I appreciate. Okay. Oh, <sighs> so you just do the 15 minute. No, somehow, some way, I got a pro plan when I first started because I got accepted into iHeartRadio and all this stuff. So I got a pro really? plan right away without Uh-oh. even paying anything. I, I lost the video on this end. You, can you still see me? I got you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. I just, I just can't see you, but that's okay. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Return to meeting. There we go. <laughs> <clears throat> We're good. Uh, okay. N- I got. I had a meeting. What were we about talking about? Uh, now you got me sidetracked. I had a meeting about. I had a meme about Zoom. I don't know if you saw it, but you know the the meme from Office Space where the guy says that'd be great. So I said, yeah, if you can get on that Zoom meeting, that'd be great because this is the Office Space now. You know. <laughs> you you oh. I'm assuming you're checking your notes for this morning's show. I'm rethinking uh, a lot of things. You know, it's it's so easy. Well, for instance, here's an article by a guy, one of my favorite, Arthur's. Um, can't even tell you his name. Four reasons why Christians believe conspiracy theories. You need to read this before removal for violating community standards. This guy, Frank... Frank something, Viola, is a hoot. And the reason why 
yeah. Okay. I'm just well, excited because my it's so easy. I got so many people sending me these little short videos and you need to make sure you watch this before they take it down. And I don't have one of them yet that's been taken down. That's true. But I'm seeing an increase of them like left and right. There's an increase of all these videos of doctors coming out saying the death toll is low and all that is happening. But that to me means people are now rising up against this and we'll see how that goes. Because they start really gathering uh, and the enforcement becomes something. Watch out, Michael. We're going to be in some trouble here. Well, as for me and my house, we will mm-hmm. serve the Lord. Amen. I'm going to keep on just living life. And uh, you can pick your nose. You can pick your friends, but you can't pick your friend's nose. Now, I haven't picked anybody's nose in a while. So it's really not affecting my life that much. I still <laughs> shake hands if people are willing. That's good. Yeah. That's a little – that's good. I feel like in the city you can't because we're so dense that it <laughs> could literally transmit. But in Iowa, it's a little different. Hey, you know, your your senator in Iowa has been uh, supporting the meat packers, and I mentioned that you had – didn't you say you have family in the Tyson food plants? Yes. So yeah. I mentioned that on my Garrett Extra yesterday because – the uh, Joni Ernst is one of like 12, 13 senators who wrote to Bill Barr to make sure prices weren't being gouged with meat and to make sure the packers are in safe conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just gave you a shout out because I know you have family in the Tyson, you know, food plant there and we're praying for you. Well, actually on Facebook. I put a post up, shout out to Governor Kim Reynolds. And it's, yeah, there's some people, actually my own brother-in-law had uh, posted that he really didn't care for what she was doing because she was trying to, according to him, she was trying to shut him down. And then Trump came through and I, I don't. I think his information is a little skewed, possibly. Well, no. What Trump did was he actually ordered all meat packing plants still open. So he made an executive order about that because he was seeing plants were going to start to close down, and he knows that that would kill the supply chain even more. So he actually ordered them to stay open. And you know what's interesting about that? The ones that tested positive were to go back to work. And the ones that tested negative were supposed to go home and draw unemployment. Here's the bottom line, okay? And here we're kind of getting off track, which is why I want to kind of stick with my main message, which is hope. Share it with gentleness and respect. Because you people that don't believe in Jesus, you're going to die and go straight to hell. What is wrong with you people? Just kidding. He's not that uh, preachy, I promise you folks, if you're just listening for the first no. time. No. For the first time. I, I'm I'm not. And, and Michael, and, one and... last thing to bookend this before I welcome my guest, Rebecca Costa. 47-minute interview, by the way. It was a different all-over-the-place interview. I think you might like it. Um, <laughs> Spreaker made me a pro when I first got on here because I got approved to iHeartRadio within the first couple months. So I don't know how that happened. That's but cool. I, I just – I haven't had to pay, thank God, so – so that is really cool because because of that, they see you as a tremendous addition and see it wouldn't work for me even if I did a really top notch because of the music. I, music for me is just, uh, it, it's a no brainer. I mean, so that's why it wouldn't work for me on, uh, on iHeart. Really? Do you think I could do a talk only format? I think you can do whatever you want, and you could syndicate it wherever you want. I mean, that's the whole point of this is that Spreaker has given us so many platforms to syndicate on. We've got Apple. We've got Google Podcasts. That's true. We've got iHeartRadio. Your show could be on any number of those. I mean, I don't know how, but my feed just started traveling to all these different sites. I think we could do that for you, too, if you wanted to really push this out there, push your message of hope out there, I should say. 
Uh, well, let me ask you a question. How, how do you, how do you gauge? Now, again, like my wife keeps on saying, who are you doing this for? Is it all about numbers? Well, no, because I'm not, you know, requiring making an income from doing this. Right. Thank God. <laughs> Cause I think I was up to about two bucks after, I don't know how many years, but anyway, how do you gauge that? How do you I'm know? About to, I'm about to share my screen. Cause I'll show you how this works. Hold on. Okay. Cool. Uh, and so you see this, I've got all these numbers. Right. Yeah. Yep. And our live uh -huh. plays, if you notice, a couple here, a couple there. <laughs> but here's right. where the most interesting thing is. Look at how many iHeartRadio oh. I can get on one day. Or Oh my goodness, that's cool. Mine doesn't look anything like that. So I've got all that's these awesome. different outlets. So we'll see. And for those who are listening, I'm just showing Mike my numbers because he's kind of curious and it's like an on-air tutorial, which is pretty cool. So, Mike, I'm curious so, to see what your numbers look like now, actually. Oh, they are. <laughs> I mean, what what was yesterday? Yesterday. All my tra and I do look at these every day. Uh, more stats. Uh, but that whole. OK, so, for instance, yesterday there were a total of 16 plays zilch on anything other than uh spreaker i think i might have had a little trickle here or there well, let me ask you do they still do plays or because my thing is switched to downloads so it's kind of interesting they only count the downloads only and not plays anymore only live plays well in my biggie for instance on the 12th i actually had nine live listens which to me is like wow that's amazing that's awesome but that's not that many listens, but that's okay because this is therapy for me. Right. So but, it's really, it's really people just sitting in on my therapy. But what, session. what is true is it's like human nature. It's like, okay, we're doing this stuff every day. Who is listening? Why are they listening? How are they listening? What, what devices are they listening on? Like it's kind of human nature to want to know that. So I know we all say oh, we do it because of radio, because we love it, but also there's a human nature to it. You know, you, now, now you got me thinking. Maybe, it, maybe I need to do a second um, show and send that off to iHeart and see if they'll. Because I think you're only allowed thirty seconds max of any music before you get into copyright issues. Oh, iHeart hasn't flagged anything actually, because I've been playing minutes of, of a song and they haven't flagged it. So, well, maybe I need to re. Uh, resubmit. Let me see here. Hold on, iHeartRadio, Alex Garrett. I'll give that a shot. And and YouTube, <laughs> they get flagged, they get left up, but here. then there's no monetizing it. I don't care if they run an ad. I don't care. I just want it to be go. heard. Look at this. This is my iHeart page. And I nice. Got everything on there. So there haven't really been censoring me. So I don't know the metrics, though, because I can only see it. I don't know if anybody subscribed on that channel or not, but it looks like I'm getting some plays. Yeah. So that's good. Anyway, Michael, I hate to cut this anyway, off, but I do have an interview that I want to air yeah. to end very close to your start. So let me kick that off with Rebecca Costa. Um, love our chats, though. This was good. And off air, we should talk about the whole iHeartRadio thing. Let me know if they accept what you do or yes. if you're going to do the show. Radio Hope, 9 a.m. Eastern. What are you talking about today? Today? Yeah, what are you going to be talking about today? Uh, about Amazing Grace and how many times we sing it, but do we really believe it? Mm. Is it really amazing? Very deep. And that actually is pretty deep. Yeah, so I'll be maybe. listening at 9. Hope you will too. Mike Myers, thanks so much. Bye. Okay. Now Leave I. Meeting. Okay, I quick. definitely right. am about to welcome my next guest, uh, Rebecca Costa. My next guest is Rebecca Costa. Rebecca, first of all, welcome to the program. I'm sorry, I lost you there for a moment. No, no worries. Hey, I'm Alex Garrett, and I am uh, talking now with Rebecca Costa. First of all, Rebecca, th thanks for joining me. 
Well, thank you for having me today. Well, let's talk a little bit. So you've been out talking about life after COVID-19 and you're a social biologist, social biologist. So for those who may not know what that is, what is a social biologist? A sociobiologist looks at the evolutionary forces that that change a society. Effectively, we're evolutionary biologists that look at larger systems, social systems, and institutions, societies, civilizations. So right now, and by the way, I was very, it's awesome that you were a keynote with uh, Abbott Technologies. You must be pretty happy that they've been able to pitch in the effort here having worked with them before. Yes, actually, Abbott was one of the first to institute a fast-tracking system inside their corporation exactly for purposes like this, where they could accelerate development. And I have been working with Abbott Labs for a number of years, so I was happy to see that that fast-tracking system actually worked. You know, sometimes you put these things in place and you don't know when and where you'll need them. Right. And of course, other things have been taken out of place. But generally, it's amazing to watch these corporations step up and do what they can. But Rebecca, I know that um, you want to talk about a whole host of issues. So let's start with vaccinations. Do you think uh, society can wait till these vaccines come out? Like they're saying late fall. Can we wait that long? No, I'm afraid I'm going to have to rain on that parade. This entire discussion about vaccines is misleading, and it's misleading the public and giving some kind of false hope. In 1984, as you know, when AIDS was uh, starting to spread, and uh, we didn't understand very much about it, we we thought that uh, a mosquito could bite an infected person and then bite another person and transmit it. I mean, that's how... Fundamentally, we didn't understand how AIDS was spreading. Uh, The head of U.S. uh, Health and and, uh, uh, Services, uh, what was it, Health and and Something Services, came out and said, hey, we're going to have a vaccine in 12 to 24 months on the outside. Uh, We really do understand this much better. We're learning so quickly, and we've put all the pharmaceutical companies and biolabs to work on this. I just want to remind everyone that was 36 years ago, wow. 36 years ago, and we do not have an AIDS vaccine today. What is sure. more likely, I mean, you know, so that sounds terrible, like, oh, you won't, we won't ever be able to prevent you from getting COVID. That's not what's important. Vaccines mm. aren't important, and preventing you from getting it is not what's important. What's important is if you get it, can your doctor give you something to keep you from dying from it? Right. Right. That's because okay. if your doctor, if you, if it's a matter of you get COVID and you go to your doctor, like any other disease that you get and you say, Hey, I feel really crappy. And your doctor writes you a prescription, you take the medicine and then you feel better. Then why do you care if you have a vaccine? Right. You so just want for, in the same now. way that if you have AIDS today, you, you, you won't die of AIDS. We can keep you alive. We can't get rid of the AIDS and we can't prevent you from getting it, but we can keep you alive. So that is more likely the scenario. Well, it's interesting to talk about all this because Dr. Fauci, who has been on TV every day now, it seems like, um, also was highly touted back in the AIDS crisis. Has he done a, as good a job here or, or not as good as he did back in, 80, in the 80s? Dr. Fauci is very good. He's very good. He's the best of the best. And we need to not try to look for ways to criticize Dr. Fauci or bend what he's saying to some political agenda. I'm really against this because if you keep doing that to scientists, they don't want to come forward. There's a reason that that when I asked people to, prior to Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, if I'd asked people to name a scientist Mm -hmm. that was, you know, the top in their field, people couldn't name one. They would name people like Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill Nye, Dr. Science, or, you know, or someone who isn't living anymore. Um, And and one of the reasons is because scientists don't don't trade in politics. Things like viruses don't have an allegiance to any political party. And and we don't like to have public profiles because inevitably something we say or something we do gets picked up by a political party and then manipulated and and used for their purposes. One way that people should think of science, people like Dr. Fauci, is they're the enemy of politics. 
Right. They, they so truly true. are because science doesn't care about politics. And so inevitably you're going to step on someone's toes or alienate someone. And so we, we've got to be very careful about marginalizing science in this country and really around the world. I, I can't make the criticism only about the United States. Dr. Fauci is correct. If Dr. Fauci has a fault, it's that he's extremely optimistic about vaccines and I part company with him there. Our history on vaccines is really bad. In all of the history of humankind, we have only successfully eliminated one disease from the planet, one. Wow. There's um, still uh, the bubonic plague. There's still tetanus and typhoid and smallpox uh, and uh, measles. The only, the only one we've gotten rid of in the entire history of humankind I'm talking about is smallpox. That's the only one. So you, our record when, is horrible. When you think of the vaccine issue, by the way, it was amazing that, you know, the vaccine official was fired or something. I don't know if you want to delve into that, but seems like he was fired or whatever was going on now he's speaking out but if it's not vaccines then is hcq hydrochloroquine are all these different treatments working or what do you see yes we're going to have a treatment and we're actually going to have a treatment much sooner than we'll ever have a vaccine i believe we'll have a treatment in maybe six months Mm. and so what do you care you see i think it's wrong to tell people we can prevent you from getting it I think what we should be telling people is if you get it and you go to your doctor and your doctor gives you a prescription and you're over it in 24 hours, what do you care if there was a vaccine or not? This is why we have a vaccine because no one died. No, you don't die of AIDS anymore. Right. Well, and they were using actually HIV treatment as part of this healing process from COVID, if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. Um, These are all related AIDS, SARS, Uh, COVID, they're all related viruses in one way or another. What gives me hope that we're on the, we got, we just got a really big clue with, with remdesivir. Remdesivir was able to disable a very, very harmful enzyme that actually hooked into the lungs and did the lungs the most damage. And it was, and, and it was very important to disarm the virus in being able to do that kind of damage. And remdesivir seemed to interrupt that, that enzyme. For science, that's a big breakthrough because it says now that the virus can be damaged to the right. point where it won't reproduce and it won't create damage in the lungs. Rebecca, obviously the media has been so skewed on what treatments to use, what not to use. How are they, when these treatments happen, are they covering it correctly or are they still trying to say, hey, don't be too... Pe- do optimistic about it. I I, I believe we uh, that we're opening too quickly. Uh, I I believe that uh, that we need to make some very clear decisions about those that are vulnerable. I happen to be sixty five years old, so I'm in that vulnerable category. I will tell you that the um, the the convalescent therapies where you take a plasma from someone who has uh, had the virus and uh, recovered and has those antibodies and you take their plasma and you inject it in people, it seems to offer some immunity and, but there's not enough plasma to immunize everyone. So what we should be doing is we should be asking people who have had COVID uh, to uh, donate their plasma, and then we should be giving convalescent therapy only to those that are vulnerable. We should be prioritizing. So in your social biology, are you, are, was part of that studying the human body, how it reacts to certain things? Like what, what can you say about the human body that we may not know right now in this cure against COVID or fight for it anyway? Well, one thing, one thing is when you're an evolutionary biologist, you look at the history of humans and how we respond over millions of years. And one thing that we did know is that when we have a common threat or a common enemy, we're used to watching movies where all of a sudden a meteor is going to hit the earth or uh, mm-hmm. aliens like War of the World, suddenly there's aliens on, on every country and suddenly uh, the po- politics and the warfare and everything go to the wayside. Uh, When faced with an immediate emergency, one of the traits of being human is we immediately collaborate. Mm -hmm. We know that by collaborating, 
we can beat an enemy that's larger than us, used to be predators that were going to eat us. We, we had a better chance of surviving those predators when we collaborated together and fought those predators off. So and true. we still have that genetic instinct in us that immediately when faced with a common danger, we collaborate together. And that may be the most uh, important instinct that we've seen come to bear on the coronavirus. So uh, right now our human instinct is to stay inside because that's what we're being told. Is it beneficial or is it time to truly, have we been locked in too long in this fight? Well, we've learned a lot about uh, humans by doing all kinds of experiments uh, in psychology and sociology. And we know that we are a troop dwelling organism uh, and that we need each other. You know, yes. um, baby rhesus monkeys will die if they don't have any touch. They, mm. they, they don't die of anything else, not of, of a disease. They die from simply not being touched by a mother or by another living creature. And we have some of that in our DNA as well. And so we need touch to thrive. And we need yep. real, tr true face-to-face -face interaction, not electronic interaction to thrive. We also know that prolonged periods of unemployment have been demonstrated to lower our capacity for happiness ever more. Mm. There are very few things that can affect your ability to be happy and to thrive for the rest of your life. But forced unemployment, and I'm not talking about retirement, is one of those things that's been studied by Nobel winning economists and psychologists and sociologists. And so we know that an event like this, if it goes on for too long and people are unemployed for too long, that it's a life sentence, that they mm -hmm. will never be as happy as they were before the unemployment. Well, now, obviously, Rebecca, you've, you've talked to a lot of people about this over crisis after crisis. It seems to me that this one, though, talking to people is just, you got to be so much more delicate than after 9-11 and then after even the recession. So how have your conversations been with people during this time compared to those other crises? Well, I'm afraid I'm not known for my sensitivity. <laughs> so I, I'm a scientist and I'm a data geek. And, and so I just look at the data and I have, this is why I have a tremendous amount of empathy for Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks. You know, I would not be a good person on that White House task force because I just lay it out the way that it is. As you have heard me say, we don't, we don't have an AIDS virus, our AIDS vaccine after 36 years. I would just tell people that, you know, if you're, if you're pinning your hopes on the coronavirus going away, it's not going away. If you're pinning your hopes on there's going to be a vaccine, there's not going to be a vaccine. Now, let's say there is a vaccine. There's the already 11 mutations and lineages of the original COVID-19. So even if we get a vaccine, it's not going to cover all of the lineages and all, right. and all of the mutations. So we have to understand that it won't be very effective, which might be worse for people to think that, oh, I can get a vaccination. Well, it's just like a flu vaccination. You're getting a flu vaccination against a small number of flu viruses that we think mm -hmm. are probably going to proliferate. But you know what? It's just Russian roulette. We're just, we're just taking our best guess. Talking with Rebecca Costa. You can follow her, by the way, at RebeccaCosta.com. And that is your Twitter, right, Rebecca Costa? Yes, it's RebeccaCosta.com. If people want more information, they go, can go directly to my website. And there are a lot of videos and articles, particularly about COVID-19. So you would be a force there and say, vaccines doesn't work. Um, would you face pushback or would they sort of say, all right, maybe she's got a point? No, I, I, I'm ter I do a lot of work in Washington, D.C., and, you know, they know me to be extremely blunt Good. and very direct. And I don't like to create false hope because I think false hope is dangerous. Mm. So, and, and so on the other hand, though, if you have a study coming out that vaccines could happen by 2022, that also damages like the emotional state. Like why would people want to hear something like that? But is it a message we have to hear for those who want the vaccine? Because I want to readjust people's thinking and say, it doesn't matter if we have a vaccine, if we have a cure. 
Exactly. No, I totally get that. The vaccine is to prevent you from getting the disease. The cure is you got the disease, your doctor gave you something, and it, the, and you don't have any more symptoms, you're fine, you go back to work. You're not contagious. So let's talk about going back, because I know this is one of your hot topics now, is trying to get back into the workforce, trying to reopen. Um, is there anything as such as doing it safely, or do we just start really opening and whatever happens, happens Maybe we all become immune to it. What is your thought on that? No, we need staged. We, need, you know, everybody's just guessing right now mm -hmm. on how to reopen, and I, I'm really against that. We have enough data that we should be staging the reopening. You know, mm -hmm. if you're over the age of 60 years old, you should not be reopening. You should not be going back to work. So there should be some dispensation allowed for people over the age of 60. If you have an underlying medical condition, you should not be going back to work. Your unemployment benefits should be extended. The government should provide you supplemental income right during that period right. of time. So we true. know who is vulnerable. So why not provide the stimulus and the support to the groups that are vulnerable? It's not like we don't have that information. Now, there's a lot of data we don't have, but that doesn't happen to be some of it. Has the working from home data started to come in yet? Like, do we know if this could be really the way of the future or will offices still be functional after all this is said and done? I, I, I believe that, you know, it's going to be a lot like what Abbott is doing. You know, when, when they start to return, you know, some, of, some people will return and it will be discovered that some people need not return immediately. I think it will be just a, a gradual easing in but I don't believe that the full numbers that used to work in the offices will return. I think some jobs will permanently be work at home jobs. And, and it is amazing with Zoom, we could do all that. But you just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the 11 mutations. Now, I had read something saying that 2012, one strain of coronavirus was discovered. I mean, how long has this been around and how did it just escape? Like, it's just amazing. We've kind of known these strains existed, yet uh, I don't know if we did enough to stop it before it actually spread. It is very rare, and, and people should know this because, you know, I'm, I'm not always the harbinger of hope and optimism, but, but I can say this. It is very, very rare for a disease to transmit from an animal to a human. But even rarer by many magnitudes is if it transmitted from an animal to a human, that that same virus could move from human to human. That almost never happens. You so, need an animal as an intermediary. What's very different about this virus and SARS and AIDS was it jumped the food chain, right, from an animal to a human, and then transmission from human to human was possible without that, that intermediary. And that's what makes these, these viruses very dangerous. They're around all over the place. Animals have all kinds of viruses. But generally, if one person gets sick, it doesn't move through the, the entire uh, human uh, population. Rebecca, you know, right now, um, people are starting to think about other news, like the Michael Flynn stuff, like all that other stuff. But isn't it dangerous to kind of take our eye off this right away because some news out of Washington's happening? I don't know. Maybe you want to weigh on that as well. Is it dangerous to disturb, distract ourselves from the actual virus right now? I believe it is. I, I, I see what you're saying. I, you know, we have an, a presidential election coming up. Right. And so yeah. that's going to start to take some headlines. Uh, we have governors saying, well, you know, uh, we, our health care system, our police and our fire and everything can't be supported unless we get money. So we're starting to see other things enter into the news. And yet I want to remind everyone the numbers are still going up in most parts of the country. Yeah. They're not coming down. Well, you talk about human collaboration, and I think everybody saying in and reducing this was one of the best things that could have happened during this time, right? To actually see the human impact of us staying inside. Well, I think you learn a lot about yourself when you have to mm -hmm. shelter in place. You know, it's a real opportunity to learn about yourself. I, I learned that you know, if I get bored, uh, I like to eat. I'm not okay. particularly hungry. And I've had to put myself on check on that because, you know, I, I'll work for a while and then I go, oh, I'm going to get something to eat. And it's so easy to walk into your kitchen when it's a few steps away. 
uh, and and I thought, wow, this is how people get really fat, you know. And I said, yep. am I hungry? And and I stood in front of my refrigerator and said, I'm actually not hungry, but there's really good stuff in that refrigerator. I know there is, and I want to eat it. And and so I I was really having to kind of go. Well, instead of that, when I get up to go to the refrigerator, I'm going to walk past the refrigerator into my backyard and do 10 minutes of gardening. And then if I'm still hungry, I'll come back in. So, you know, you, I, I'm a big believer that you may have a lot of bad habits or you may have instincts to do things like shop online right. all day right. when you're not working, right? That might be your entertainment. And you know <laughs> darn well, you're racking up credit card bills. You mm -hmm. don't have a job. You know, there's no money coming in. I, I don't believe that you can stop those behaviors. I think you have to replace them. Mm. You have to replace them with something else. And I call that compensatory behavior. You have to find a compensatory behavior that feels just as good and then just substitute it. Yeah, this podcast has kind of been that because I love just going on and talking with people like yourself who's given us some updates. But I would ask you, with this lockdown, and it's because you observe human nature and all that, could the will start certainly start disappearing from people the longer this goes on? I'm sorry, catch I couldn't catch that. Say well, that again. Do you think the human will, the human spirit, will start to decrease more as we keep locked in, or how do we avoid that from happening? Well, I think we're going to see a lot of people um, struggle with getting. Um, uh, joyful, thriving, uh, being excited about life in the way that they might have been prior to the lockdown. Mm. Um, as I mentioned before, we have many, many studies that show that over a long period of unemployment, people mm. don't return to the same levels of happiness that they had prior to the forced unemployment. That's going to be a problem for a lot of people. I also think that a lot of people are, have you know dug themselves into a hole financially and they're going to have to figure out how to get out and not everybody's going to get out. So there's going to be some consequences, some mental health consequences for people and I, I am concerned about that. Well, and, and now it's come to the point where essential workers are actually being asked, you know, if they want to apply to become an essential worker and that may not be safe, but if they are able to, do you encourage that? to apply for essential work if you can do it? It depends. It depends. Again, I think we've identified those people that it would be very safe. I'd apply yeah. to be an essential worker if I already had COVID-19 uh, and there was a good chance. We don't know for sure that you're immune to getting mm. it again, but it, it seems like it. And based on the history of viruses that are similar to this, uh, we think that you are immune. So if I had COVID-19, and I had the antibodies, I would apply. If I was a young person in my 20s and I was strong and athletic and, and in pretty good health, I would probably apply because I probably am gonna, you know, if I catch it, get some flu symptoms and then that would be it. But if I were an older person that was retired and, or had some underlying health conditions, I definitely would not apply. Again, we know what makes you vulnerable, right, to the disease. But should government, I guess my question is, should government encourage essential work or should they say, we're going to find businesses that already have employees to reopen them? Like I, they have to toe a fine line there, don't they? I think that what the government should be doing is being very specific about who, sh who should and could return to work. So at the top of the pyramid, right, the, it are for essential workers, are people, young people that are healthy right. and who have, who had the COVID, uh, uh, you know, test positive for antibodies, had COVID and are probably immune to it. That's at the very, that's the small uh, triangle at the top of the pyramid. Then one level down, people who haven't had COVID, but are middle-aged or young and healthy yeah. and no underlying conditions. And then the next layer and layer and way at the bottom is over 65 and, you know, with uh, one or two underlying health conditions, right? Right. So think of it as a pyramid and the government should be identifying very specifically the characteristics of who are most likely 
to be mm -hmm. safe to return, second most likely, third most likely, and I don't see them doing that. And why is that? They just don't know how to wrap their heads around this kind of thinking you have? I think the thinking is the worst kind of thinking. It's muddled. Mm. It's muddled. It's sort of, okay, restaurants can have half the tables and, and, and they're approaching it completely wrong. Mm. This isn't about the number of tables. It's about who the servers are. Right. If I go into a restaurant and there's half the tables, but the person who comes and serves me is sniffling and is 65 years old and kind of hobbling, I'm not going to feel very good about that. First right. of all, I'm not going to a restaurant. I'm 65 and I don't care, by the way, mm. what my governor says. I don't care what my mayor says. I don't care what my county says. I don't care what the president of the United States says. And I don't care what Dr. Fauci or Dr. Burke say. I'm not leaving my home Well, now, because so, I know better. But once everything is, you know, found to have reduced, you will go back out there, right? Because there are some people saying, I'll never go back out again. But you don't seem that kind that would just stay in the rest of life. No, they're, they're insane. Those are insane people and you don't, you know. Look, look uh, when you take opinions, you've got to cut off the two ends, right? The two extremes. And look for people who, uh, who are making cautious but well-founded decisions. Rebecca, the other story that's happening here in New York is the nursing home issue. And I mean, how would they, how could they let people COVID positive back in these nursing homes and at least not even tell the families? Like this was a botched operation as far as that. Well, what they need to do, what they need to do is remember we have these five minute, five to 15 minute tests. So you would ask somebody to come into the lobby, give them a five to 15 minute test. Okay. and say, we cannot allow you in until we get the test results. So, you can, you know, it is possible. Abbott is manufacturing millions of these machines. It will be a very short amount of time before these nursing homes can have these machines, and they'll need to train somebody on it. And the, and the, the testing will get easier and easier until it becomes like a pregnancy test, and you could do it at home. But people would have to give evidence that they tested at the time they go in, because remember, if you tested yesterday, I didn't mean you don't have it today. Correct. So, yep. you, so, there, so the time between the test and contacting someone has to be very, very short. It has to be very immediate. And people really need to understand that. Testing once what doesn't mean anything. Well, that's something they want to test those who've had it again and see if, that, if they came back, which is actually a good idea. But you know what's amazing? Washington State, for all the grief it's getting for being the first thing, Apparently, they did testing without the CDC telling them to, you know, or telling them not to. I don't know. But was that a game changer when they decided to do it against CDC uh, recommendation? Yes, it, it was a game changer for them. And, and you've seen that they never got out of control like New York. You know, right. I mean, they, they, everyone was criticizing them. Look, when, it, when an emergency like this happens, uh, you're either going to overreact or underreact. There's no exact, you know, the, the reaction mm -hmm. you had was exactly proportional because you don't know what you're dealing with. So if you look at states like uh, California and Washington, where they shut down very, very soon, everyone was going, it's martial law, they're overreacting. Mm -hmm. Well, now when you look at their numbers, you realize they weren't overreacting at all. But imagine if their numbers had just continued to climb like New York, then they, you know, they probably would be out of job come next election. And how so were, how there's were never they able, a way to call it right. How were they able to contain it to be less than what people expected? Because there was no treatment at the time, so how'd they do it? Well, for one, in New York, in, uh, excuse me, in Washington, it was around a particular nursing home. You remember the first fatality came out of a nursing home. And then they began testing around that nursing home. And then they started to test everyone who had visited someone and or who, who had delivered supplies. And so it was a, it was a crude form of contact tracing, you know, okay. before they got the computer programs in. So they were able to pretty much uh, kind of lasso it in. Are you, uh, are you nervous about this contact tracing? I know there have been mixed stories on it. So what can you tell us about that whole effort as we stand right now? Well, every time we look at something like this, where we're going to be doing contact tracing there in the West, where, you know, where we, we value our liberty and our privacy mm -hmm. and our freedom, 
that's embedded in our culture. And everyone worries about privacy, right? Oh my gosh, right. they're going to be tracking my phone and so on and so forth. And I have news for everyone. There is no privacy. <laughs> that, that train left the station a long time ago. And, and everyone was up in arms about, uh, you know, b- uh, beta data that the, that the U.S. government was collecting. What, the data that Amazon and Macy's collects and Target collects on you just puts the government data to shame. So I, I, I think people are really, you know, this idea of privacy, it's just a fantasy. It's a fantasy that we're trying to hold on to that doesn't exist anymore. You just mentioned, Wal- you know, Target and Macy's and all them. And that reminds me, a lot of that's cashless. So do you think from where you're sitting now, do you think we could end up a cashless society? Is that going to be a push now through COVID? I mean, they've already yes. said money's tainted. So there's a sign right there. Yes. Yes. I, you know, I wrote a book, The Watchman's Rattle, uh, six or seven years ago. And at the time I had said there will be a universal digital currency that will be, uh, you know, useful everywhere in the world. And everywhere in the world, there'll be an exchange rate for that universal currency, but there will no longer be any kind of paper denominations and coins and those kinds of things. Those are, those are just, you know, disease spreading mechanisms. Well, let me ask you, are you in favor of that or no? Because I, I still think going cash, it scares the bejesus out of me. No, I, I think we, we will be a cashless society. I think we'll have a Bitcoin type of universal currency that all uh, countries will accept. And actually, that will be better because if you think about how currencies are valued right now, nobody can explain to you how a currency is valued or what it's tied to. It's not tied to your, DG, your GDP. It's not, tied, it's not tied to anything. It's just political value. Well, I, it seems to me like the universal currency, they were trying to do it at the EU with the euros. And I guess only Britain didn't do it. The other countries went along with it. Was that a experiment? How did that go? I mean, we saw some uprising about it, but how was the euro, the universal currency in Europe um, from what you saw during that time? Well, that, that was very problematic from the start because all it was going to take was one country to fudge their books or ha- mm-hmm. use kind of non-standard uh, accounting practices and it was going to take all the rest of the euro down. And mm-hmm. that country happened to be Greece. And then once they started looking at Italy and Spain and, you know, it was just problematic all over the place. It's, it's, sta- it's fairly stable now, but there was a reason that, that uh, you know, the UK wanted to get out of uh, the euro. I, I find the euro to be very, very dangerous. I think that it's better to have some kind of universal digital currency and, mm. and not be talking about some, some currency that's dependent on a group of countries being honest about their fiscal state. Uh, why are people paranoid about this if it could actually be a good thing? Well, you know, it, it, sometimes change has to be forced. I mean, you know, we, we, kind of, we kind of get into a routine and it becomes part of the reality that we've come to know, that we've grown up with. It's mm-hmm. really hard. I'm 65, as I've said, and sometimes it's just hard to let go. You know, we don't dial phones like this anymore. Right. We don't turn, you know, we don't lower our window on our automobile by doing this anymore. And we're not going to be, you know, buying things at the store by doing this anymore. You know, I mean, it, it just isn't going to happen. Progress begins to accelerate over a period of time. This is true of all societies. And I've spent my entire life studying this. Progress begins to accelerate. It begins to move faster and faster and faster. Our brains mm-hmm. don't change with progress. Uh, we, we have the same brains we've had for a couple of million years with very little change. Right. And so there's a gap that occurs between how fast change begins to occur and what our brains can actually understand. So what our brains understand today is barter, right? You have some carrots, I have some eggs, and we, you know, we argue until we make a good trade. What we don't understand is credit default swaps. You know, uh, people on Wall Street, the mechanisms are so complex, they don't always understand why the market is behaving the way it is or why currencies are moving the way they are. 
right? It's well, because the global economics is too too complex. It is, and our our dollar seems to not know what it wants to do. One day the market's up, one day the market's down. It's just such a um, probability. But back to your book. Uh, it's called The Watchman's Rattle, A Radical New Theory of, of Collapse. Shouldn't people read this kind of book now because it'll maybe prepare them for either what's to come or what we're in now? I think it would be comforting for people to read The Watchman's Rattle because they could see what causes societies to go into unilateral collapse prior to what the triggering event is. My purpose for writing that book wasn't to describe what set the Roman Empire or the Egyptian Empire or the Khmer Empire to collapse because historians have studied the triggering event. I wanted to know, were people behaving, ordinary people, people on Main Street, were they behaving in some way that made that triggering event so powerful? And I wrote that book, what, six or seven years ago. And of course, you know, it shot to the top of Amazon's bestsellers and went to 27 mm -hmm. countries and became a, I mean, it was a dark horse for a book. Who wants, who thinks that a sociobiologist is going to write a bestseller? Pro not my publisher, that's for <laughs> sure. Well, and, and people can still get the book, right? Not only through your website. They but can, they can get it on Amazon uh, and they can get it in 27 different languages. I think it would make people feel comfortable in that, Collapse doesn't mean everybody's going to die and mm. everything's going to go into chaos. All collapse means is that the institutions and the systems and the complexity that the society has put together, it, it, it reverses. And day-to-day and -day life becomes much more simple to the point where our brains can actually handle and manage day-to-day -day life. I was going to say, so you feel like we just were running around too much and this was a perfect time to slow everybody down. Right? I mean, that's kind of, what do you think about that? Well, it, it is. It's a good time to say, you know, what do I really understand about, you know, my financial portfolio? You know, mm. what do I understand about my health? What do I really understand, you know, about myself, my life, mm. what I want, what's important to me? Um, when, you're, when, you're, when you're a human doing instead of a human being, when you're busying yourself, which is what our lives are. Yeah. I mean, from the moment we wake up, let's face it, we're moving. We're yeah. moving and we're busy doing this and we got to make money and we got to pay those bills and I'm going on a date and, and I have laundry to do and I didn't pick up the dry cleaning and the gas tank's got to be full. You, you know, we're just going, going, going. And when something like this happens, it feels really unnatural and really uncomfortable. It does. But uh, so necessary. Well, and, and so... With the human, you know, nature, though, you can't stop yourself from protesting if you want to protest. So what are your thoughts on that human side of this, where people are protesting now? Well, you know, I, I think it's fine that they want to protest, you know? I, I mean, what are you protesting against? I, I really am confused. I don't understand what they're protesting against. They, they want the opportunity to open up their businesses, Right. right? And they're accepting the fact that they could be infected or they could infect. Right? That's so, true, yes. yep. yeah. So, whose fault is it that they're protesting? I would argue it's the government's failure to put in place a pathway to reopening that protects those are, that are vulnerable and allows those that are not, right, to go right back to their lives. Yeah. And by the way, you're just talking about being busy and this thing, the phone, is probably one of the most things keeping us active because it's always pinging us and all that. But how is technology during you this know how many times? Do you know how many times on average you'll look at your phone in, one, in, in an eight-hour day? I think it's about like maybe more than an hour's worth of that, like more than 60 minutes of it. 180 times you'll look at your phone. In one hour. No, in one day. Oh, in one day. Uh, yeah. That still makes me want to throw my phone across the room, but, that'll, but I'll save that. But how has technology um, affected this pandemic, and has it truly brought us together or made people more lonely? That's, we don't know that. We mm. don't know that. I mean, there's a huge laboratory experiment going on right now. Again, mm. 
when I think of, well, does it make people more lonely or less lonely? I think of groups of people. I think of my nephews that are under the age of 18 who have grown up with, you know, their friends are people that they know on Facebook, right? And some they've never met. So I think, you know, for a young age group, no effect. For an older age group over the age of 65 that really, you know, didn't grow up with this kind of electronic communication, it probably feels a little sad for them yeah. and a little yeah. bit isolating and uncomfortable for them. Um, and then, you know, there's the, there's everybody in between. So I think it depends on a little bit um, how comfortable you are with change right. and technology, how resilient you are. And how adventurous you are. You know, did you keep that spirit of adventure and that desire for, to learn something? Um, you know, are, are you interested in trying new things? I think if you have some of that, if you're in an older community, then, you know, this has been a fun time because you've learned new tricks. And by the way, we want to, I want to have you back because this is, this is not an ending conversation here. You know, we got to keep this conversation going as things update. So would you mind coming back to talk more about this? Cause I love that. Absolutely. To have you. I'm, I'm always happy to talk to you. Rebecca, how many zoom meetings have you had over these last two months? Um, are you on it every day or do you take a zoom break? How does that work? for you? I've been doing three and four <laughs> zoom meetings every day and it's been, it's been really incredible. Um, I think it started such an interesting conversation, a conversation that many people who have programs like yourself didn't expect to be talking about. Right. Well, right, because Zoom's, you know, some people knew of Zoom. I heard of it, but I didn't know much about it until now. And it's such a better technology than Skype. But do you have then Zoom fatigue? Because that's actually a thing now that they're talking about. I, I don't. I don't have Zoom fatigue because I'm very comfortable. You know, I, I originally used Skype and then prior to that, some really horrible video software that, you know, kept buffering and was terrible. But, you know, I've worked in Silicon Valley for most of my life, uh, three quarters of my life. And so I'm always trying to get ahead of what's the next best technology and as a result of that, it, this has been very comfortable for me. So it's, it's awesome. not anything new for me. And Silicon Valley, I want to hit you with that. Elon Musk is a little pent up. He wants to get back. He wants to do this. Is Silicon Valley going to start to say, hey, let our plants open? Or what are you seeing from there? I think Silicon Valley will be um, very creative in the measurements that they take. Uh, and, and you can already see that at uh, Amazon, where... As you're walking into the facility, they're using facial recognition software and other some advanced software to be able to just take your temperature as you're walking into the building. So they're going to be leaning on and inventing things that allow you to give feedback on illness immediately. And I think from there, it'll percolate to airports, where as you walk through, there isn't going to be somebody you know, standing there and, and taking your temperature. But they'll be looking for other kinds of things. And it may very well be that, you know, prior to 9-11, if I had said they're going to make everyone line up, take their shoes off, open their computers and put them on a conveyor, you would have said, you're insane. You know, I thought it might happen. I thought after an attack, something like that could happen. In that same way, things are going to change, right? They're going to change just like we go through security to get on a plane and we take our shoes off, you know, and get on the other side and put our shoes back on. Those things have become normalized. And in that same way, there are going to be new things that are normalized. Perhaps when you come in, they they give you an Abbott test Mm -hmm. and they make you wait in a room until your test is clear. And if your test is clear, you go through exit A. And if your test says no, you have the active virus, you're welcome to go over here to B, where we're going to put you on a bus and take you to a hotel next to the airport where you'll be quarantined for two weeks until your test says, you know, your test is negative. I mean, I mean, something's going to change like that. It's going to get organized in the same way that the TSA organized. And, but that sounds so positive to just put them in quarantine right away. 
which I really don't know if we did after we sent over the first wave from Wuhan in February. I don't know if we quarantined them very well, and that's how this thing started. No, we asked people to self-quarantine. Yeah, nobody. We didn't quarantine them, and this was a mistake. We said, you need, you, you have a temperature, you need to go to wherever you were going to, whether right. it was a hotel or, or to a friend's house or to your home, and you need to self-quarantine for two weeks. Mm. Nobody's checking, you know. So, so I can come off a plane. I do a lot of traveling. I come off a plane from China. They said, hey, you have a temperature. I'd say, okay, I'm going to stop at the grocery store on my way home because <laughs> I've got no food home. Right. So, you know, voluntary self-quarantining doesn't work. If mm. you really want to get a handle and make the world safe, you have to have quick instant testing that's very cheap to do and then you have to separate and you have to cull from the herd those that are infectors well that's and those people have to be quarantined could we it see, has to be like, mandatory quarantining could we see like a knock on the door hey do you have this we know you have this and they take you out of the home is that what's next or sure sure I, we want to give you a test it'll take five minutes it won't cost you anything I'm sorry if you have the disease and you, and, and I'm not talking about the antibodies. If you have the disease, we need to quarantine you. And they would bring them out of the house into the hospital or would they, cause they wouldn't do it in the house, right? They wouldn't let them stay in the house. No, I don't think you can allow people to just voluntarily do it. That's, that's mm. just like speed limits. I mean, how many of us would drive at the speed limit if there was no highway patrol? Well, Rebecca, this is very eye-opening because it's kind of challenging my thought process. And so uh, <laughs> I know you've been doing this for years and I, I love your expertise. So come on back. Well, thank you again. I appreciate it. Rebecca. Yes, thank you, Rebecca, for joining us. And it did, that conversation really has um, blown my mind a little bit because I don't believe in going to the home and taking someone out, but she does. So we'll have to see how that goes, if that gets that point. Now, one other thing that I've been, as as this article was going on, uh, as this interview was going on, one thing I've been talking to people about now early this morning is this play. Do you remember this from 2010? Wait for it. Ground ball, right side. Cabrera will cut it off. Got a lot of good covers. He's out. Oh! Jim Joyce on, uh, let me see the date of that, on June 2nd, 2010, did rob um, Andre, um, Andres, Armando Galarraga out of a perfect game. Galarraga's foot clearly hit the base first, but Jason Donald was called safe. And now, 10 years later, actually later in the year, June 10, 2020, will be 10 years later, Galarraga, according to The Atlantic, would like Major League Baseball. He told Major League ba- told the Atlantic, The Athletic, how can Major League Baseball give me the perfect game? Because it was perfect, right? So, 10 years later, he has this thing still bothering him, eat at him, even after a book he made with Jim Joyce in 2012 called Nobody's Perfect, Two Men, One Call, and a Game for Baseball History. That's just what it is. Baseball history. You cannot recognize something that's already happened as not happening. (laughs) You cannot recognize human error in the name of fairness. Or you cannot overturn human error and the sacredness of a box score, sacredness of a baseball game. In the name of fairness, I'm sorry, you just can't. And as Yahoo's writer Mark Townsend points out, doing so would only create a flood of similar requests over missed calls that may have changed outcomes of games and altered milestone moments. So, someone called this, you know, a a crappy comparison. But I truly believe, if you overturn this call, this safe call to an out call. You might as well put Derek Jeter back on second in the 96 ALCS instead of a home run. You might as well give Nohan 
Santana his name back, Johan, and call that uh, hit, call that foul ball a fair ball against him in 2012. You might as well just rewrite history then, right? Because that's what we kind of been doing. Now it's going to hit baseball? I don't think so. But he does have one intriguing point, this Armando Gallardo. I don't want to die. And then they'll be like, you know what? He threw a perfect game. And I can sympathize with him on that. Because yes, the Mets retired Tom Seaver's number years ago. But only after dementia. When he was diagnosed with dementia. And couldn't even go to his own party. Did they make 41 Tom Seaver way. Only after the diagnosis. And his inability to come out to City Field. After being, by the way, not only... uh, Terrific, Tom Terrific, but also being an amazing announcer with Gary Thorne on Pix 11 and being a very good supporter. He actually did go to Sports Night a couple times uh, at the Henry Viscardi School. Tonight would have been the 53rd, by the way. And, um, And it's just, that was a shame that the Mets waited till he had dementia to actually honor him. So I get where Galarraga's Voicing his frustration. But on the other hand, if we truly start recognizing one MLB finished game and overturning it to be something it wasn't, then there will be a reckoning of other games and missed calls and whatever else you want to say. That could forever alter history. And we don't want that. We want history to say the same. Baseball history is sacred. Human error is sacred. And with that, I now implore you to tune over to Radio Hope right now, 9 a.m. Eastern, Radio Hope, Mike Myers. We'll talk to you tomorrow.